Hey guys, welcome back to Bellavet, and today we are going to be talking all about how to avoid a pet emergency. Welcome back to Bella Vet. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I am a newly graduated um, emergency veterinarian living in Chicago. So today I thought we could chat all about how to avoid a pet emergency. And first things first, I kind of want to just give you a little PSA from all veterinarians that, you know, at the end of the day, we want to see your pets healthy and happy and, you know, living their lives. And, uh, and that's a big reason why I'm making this video because there are some things that you can do uh, to help make your home safer and things like that so that you avoid a pet emergency. And um, yeah, and I think unfortunately sometimes there can be this, this stigma that, oh, vets are in it for the money or something like that. And I like to think that maybe this is just a little bit of evidence to the contrary um, because throughout this whole video, I'm essentially telling you how to avoid my place of work, how to save uh, your pet's life, how to save you heartbreak, and how to save you money because the emergency room can be pretty expensive sometimes. And just a couple things to keep in mind in case you ever do have to visit the pet ER. Um, first things first, no one wants to go to the pet emergency room um, and that's part of my job. No one ever wants to, you know, be a client of mine, <laughs> understandably so. No one ever wants to have a pet emergency um, or spend their Friday night in the emergency room. Um, but it is a place that emotions can run really high and so just know that if you're on the end of, you know, if, if you're the pet owner bringing their pet in, it can be a frustrating place, it can be a scary place sometimes. I do my best to try to alleviate that as much as I can. It's one of the things I take pride in in being an emergency vet is, you know, guiding someone through a really scary situation and kind of being that that light for them. Um, but just know, just, just really try to keep in mind that, you know, all the nurses, all the receptionists, all the veterinarians that are taking care of you and your pet, they're humans and I know that emotions can run high but just do your best try to be nice to them you know I know it's a really scary time but they're here to help you so also like I mentioned earlier the emergency room is pretty expensive and there's a couple reasons for that we have to keep the lights on 24 7 we have to keep it staffed 24 7 that comes at an expense and also um, emergency rooms have to be really well stocked more so than you know just your average general practice because we have to be prepared for just about anything and one last thing, in case you do have to go to the emergency room, uh, emergency rooms are based on the triage system. And that means that things, uh, that, that patients get seen in the order in which they arrive, um, kind of first come, first serve. But the only exception to that is that if uh, something is really critical, basically if something uh, needs medical attention or else it will pass away, um, you know, if it needs medical attention immediately, it will get seen immediately. So um, in our hospital, that's what we call a stat or that's what we call you know an urgent case and then we also have stable cases so if you bring your pet in and they're otherwise stable they're just having you know vomiting or diarrhea or you think they may have broken a toe or something uh, usually that pet will wait around longer than a pet that's having an anaphylactic allergic reaction because that pet they're gonna need to have medications and stuff like that um, immediately or else really bad things could happen so um, it can be frustrating uh, for people to, to learn about that system you know it can uh, it can um, add to wait times and things like that but if you know that going in you know it kind of helps set your expectations a little bit and in case you do have to come to the pet ER, one of the things um, that can be really surprising is how much it costs because in human medicine, most people have insurance and so they don't actually see you know, the amount that their doctor's visits or that their hospital stays cost um, or that they at least typically don't have to pay it. Um, you know, insurance would cover some amount of it. Um, and in uh, veterinary medicine, at least, you know, 10 years ago, we really didn't have that. And so when people um, bring their pet to the vet and are paying for their pet's health care, you know, they're paying for all of it. It, it isn't, um, you know, covered in any way, uh, typically. But nowadays, in the last 10 years, especially the last five years, um, something called pet insurance has been taking off, which as a veterinarian, 
I absolutely love because there are a lot of, of really tough decisions that um, sometimes have to be made based on finances, you know, how much care can someone afford to pay for their animal for, um, which which are really hard conversations to have. And so um, when when any of my friends are getting are adopting a new dog or getting a new puppy, I'm always like, get some health insurance, uh, some pet insurance, because, um, you know, you never know when your animal is going to run into one of these emergencies. Um, and some pet insurance even helps with, you know, every day uh, or, you know, just going to the vet for vaccines and things like that too, which is great. Um, so it's also helpful to have a savings account because um, some of these, uh, you know, a lot of pet insurance, it they, they reimburse you, um, but just to cover, you know, that initial bill before you're reimbursed, it's always really great to have an emergency savings account. And without further ado, here are my tips to help save your pet's life, how to help save you heartbreak and also save you money. So first up, we're gonna chat about dogs and the first main category that we're going to talk about is toxicities because it is one of the most preventable things. If you don't have these things in your house or if you keep them in really safe places where your animals can't get to them, um, then you won't end up in the emergency room. Um, and the first big one is chocolate. And chocolate, uh, basically the active ingredient that is toxic to dogs is actually pretty similar to caffeine. Um, and it's kind of like a cousin of caffeine, if you will. And um, it can cause basically for them to be hyperactive, hyper excitable. It can cause them to have a really fast heart rate. Um, and if it gets really bad, um, it can cause them to have heart arrhythmias. Basically their heart start, stops beating at the right rhythm and starts beating at a, a scary rhythm. Um, and some of those can even be life-threatening. So um, how chocolate works is basically the more concentrated it is, the worse it is, and the smaller amount it takes to make your pet sick. So something like white chocolate is safer um, than something like milk chocolate, which is more toxic, and dark chocolate is more toxic than milk chocolate and then something like baking chocolate is, is, the, is the worst and it'll take um, the, the smallest amount to make your pet sick. Next up is grapes, and this is one that you know I had always heard. Oh yeah, chocolate you can't give it to dogs. Yep, yep, yep. But grapes was something that um, even as an animal lover and as a future veterinarian, you know, when I was younger, um, it took it took me a long time to learn about that grapes were toxic to dogs, and um, grapes are toxic to the kidney. And it's really interesting because we basically the research is still out. We don't entirely know what the toxic uh, molecule is in grapes yet. Um, but we do know that it affects different dogs differently, which can also be frustrating because with some dogs, um, they can have one grape and get really, really, really sick. And then other dogs, they it takes a lot more grapes to make them sick. Um, and also under this category is raisins, of course. Um, and it's also really important, you know, to think about, oh, they might get into a whole batch of grapes but they can, basically if they get into a whole can of raisins, there might be more grapes in the raisins than, in, you know, than, than they could eat in the same volume of grapes. So just something to keep in mind. And um, yeah, so we think that there could be some sort of genetic predisposition uh, situation for dogs. Maybe some are just more sensitive to grapes than others. Um, but usually if a dog um, ingests grapes, we tend to recommend a hospital stay. So. Definitely something to avoid, definitely something to keep out on high shelf, or if you're not that crazy about grapes, just don't keep them in your house. Next toxicity is onions and garlic. So they have a similar compound, um, they cause a similar problem. Um, and basically what can happen is uh, the, the toxic compound in them messes with the red blood cells. And um, that can actually cause the red blood cells to be deformed and uh, what happens is the red blood cells lice or they break open. And um, if a red blood cell is broken open, it can't do its job. And if it happens too much, then you're in a, essentially losing red blood cells and you can get a pretty scary anemia if enough is ingested. So something to keep in mind. And this is also a big one that um, when, when animals come in through the ER for eating them, it's not usually that they got one off the counter, it's usually that they got one in the trash. So also make sure your trash is locked up, <laughs> make sure your trash um, is in a safe place um, that your animals can't get into. 
So the next big one is rat poison. And uh, rat poison essentially impairs an animal's ability to clot properly. That's one of the forms of rat poison. Um, and then the other form of rat poison basically messes with um, the uh, calcium and phosphorus in an animal's body and it can cause um, basically shaking and, and neurologic problems. Um, and yeah, so there's different kinds of rat poison. Um, it's definitely something to keep an eye on and, uh, and and do your best to keep out of your pet's reach. Either don't use it in your house, um, but it's also something to watch out for. Um, some of the ones that I've seen, um, the, the owner didn't have it in their house, but their neighbor had it in their lawn or something like that. So it can be in the environment. So definitely watch out for that. And if your animal does ingest it, it's definitely one of those toxins to make sure, I mean, all of these toxins really, but this one especially, make sure that you get to the vet as soon as possible because the sooner that you can decontaminate it, um, the animal, then, then the better chance that they have. Next up is human medications, and there are too many to name, and they all cause different things, basically. Um, and this also goes for pet medications as well, if they accidentally get into the whole bottle of a prescription that, that they're given. Um, but some of the more common ones are Tylenol and Ibuprofen. Um, also, some of the more common ones recently are things like Adderall or antidepressants. Um, and yeah, so all of those things can affect your animal in different ways. Some affect the liver, some affect the kidney, some affect, uh, affect um, the neurologic status. Um, definitely keep an eye on that. Keep it locked up somewhere safe where your animal can't get to it. Next big category is plants, also kind of under toxicities. Um, there are a lot of toxic plants. A really good um, resource is the ASPCA, uh, I believe the Pet Poison Hotline. I'll leave a, a link below of a couple different, um, you know, really good information sources. If your pet gets into a plant and you think, oh my goodness, this is you know, bad is a safe, uh, you can you can look it up there. And uh, one of the big ones that I think a lot of people don't know about, and there's never a warning when you go to the store, is um, something called a sago palm. And um, it's just, a, a, it looks like a little uh, itty bitty palm tree or like a fern almost. Um, it's got kind of like a bigger base and then um, like fern or, or palm leaves. And um, yeah, that one is just really toxic to your pet. So make sure um, that I personally would just avoid having it in your house. Um, but this is also a good reminder to look up what species of plants you have as house plants and you know, look them up on the Pet Poison Hotline and uh, see how toxic they are to uh, your animal if they're toxic. And um, if so, if you should keep them in your house, if you should get rid of it or just keep it in a really high place where your animal can't get to it. The next one is uh, THC, also known as marijuana or weed, and uh, yeah, especially at least um, in my state, it's legal, so we're seeing a lot more of these uh, recently, um, and even if someone just doesn't have it in their household, it can also be in the environment and an animal picks up a little piece of something when they go for a walk, and uh, yeah, it's becoming a lot more common, and basically it causes an animal to do several things, um, one of which they dribble urine, um, and they also have ataxia, which is just a fancy doctor word for, uh, they have like a very wobbly kind of spazzy gait. And, um, and the, the third thing that happens is an animal becomes something called hyperesthetic, which is just another fancy doctor term that means they overreact to movement and light and sound. So one of the ways that we test this in the clinic is um, we do something called a menace response, which is uh, essentially we take our hand, and this is just a neurologic test for, for any animal. Um, it's basically one way to test vision in a, in a way. Um, and we, we take our hand and we just put it far enough away from their face and uh, like maybe six to 12 inches and we just look our hand and they usually are supposed to blink. Well, a dog that has ingested uh, THC, uh, when we do this, they way overreact to it. And so when we flick our hand, they're like, whoa, whoa. And they blink really, or, or if we flick our hand from really far away, then, then they have the, the response that we'd normally expect from you know a hand flick like right here. And um, so it's, uh, Luckily, this is one of the um, toxins where typically 
it's it's not too bad um if they ingest enough of it then they can you know their heart can slow and they can even go into a comatose like state um and it can cause you know them they'll need to be hospitalized and things like that but most of the time when i see these these animals just need a little bit of anti-nausea medication we typically run a little bit of blood work and um, give them some fluids monitor them for a couple hours and if they're improving then we offer to send them home so um luckily this one uh on average is is a is a pretty benign one um it can be serious um so just in case again let's avoid the er let's make sure that our animals don't get into this both wherever you keep it and also in the trash make sure that you keep your trash locked up <laughs> and last toxicity that we're going to talk about is something called xylitol which is an artificial sweetener um and uh it's used in like sugar-free gum and things like that but one of the places that you have to keep an eye out for it um is in peanut butter because a lot of people uh have peanut butter it's one of those things that they'll give to their dogs to make them you know go like that and um or if they're giving them a pill they'll give it with their pills um and it's one of those things just make sure you get like all natural peanut butter. Um, I tend to like the Smucker's kind that you have to stir up because I think the ingredients are literally like peanuts and oil and that's it. Um, and so basically the fewer ingredients for peanut butter for me, the better. Um, and uh, yeah, but sometimes if uh, a peanut butter is artificially sweetened with xylitol, um, that can be toxic to dogs. And basically what happens is it messes with their liver. What it can cause in dogs is it can cause them to have low blood sugar. Um, and you can think of this as, you know, if it's given to a dog, it's essentially giving them fake sugar. So their body sees it and says, oh, I think that's sugar. I'm gonna release insulin, which brings our, you know, which, which preps our body for, for an influx of sugar Sugar, it helps you know combat it um, but then their body can't use it the same way it uses sugar so it tricked their body into releasing insulin without actually giving it an energy source to combat that insulin release so what happens is the insulin works and it makes their blood sugar really low which um, can cause a bunch of problems and uh, yeah so just make sure that anything you give your animals if it's people food um, or if especially if it's peanut butter make sure it does not have an artificial sweetener like xylitol in it okay we're past toxicities and the next big category is something that is near and dear to my heart as someone who has a dog that um, doesn't always do well with other dogs. Um, sometimes she does and sometimes she doesn't. Um, and basically it's dog fights or hit by cars or, or basically um, traumatic injuries that can happen to dogs um, that are preventable. So uh, one of the biggest ways that you can prevent uh, a dog fight or a dog attack or you know um, getting loose and getting hit by a car is to keep your pet on a leash. Um, I am such a huge proponent of this because I think one of the things that people sometimes understandably don't realize is that just because their animal is super nice and loves other dogs doesn't mean that the dog that they are running up to likes other dogs. So if I'm at the park and uh, I know that is the, the park has a leash law and I've got my dog on a leash and somebody else has their dog running off leash and they run up to mine and they don't have control over, you know, asking their dog to come back to them. Um, my dog, she's half blind and she gets spooked when dogs come up on our blind side, understandably. And, um, and you know, a, a fight can break out. I've had some, some really scary close calls and so it's one of those things that please, 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 if you're going to a park or anything like that where there is a leash law, please just obey it because it is the only thing that's keeping pets like mine safe uh, and, you know, able to live their lives. And they love going for walks. They love, you know, my dog loves people. My dog loves other dogs that are on leash that she can, you know, meet very slowly and in a controlled way. Um, and yeah, so one of the best ways to prevent dog bites, dog fights, hit by cars um, is to keep your dog on a leash and please, please, please do it. And if you need to have your dog run off leash, you know, there are dog parks, there are places for that. Um, but just, just please uh, don't break the law just because, you know, it's, it's inconvenient for you um, and you want to let your dog run off leash. Think about the safety of others and of your own pet is so, so, so important.
The next uh, preventable emergency is a foreign body. Um, and that means uh, when your dog comes in, usually um, they're either feeling sick, they may be vomiting a lot or something like that. They might not be able to keep food down. And it might be because they ate a rock or a sock or a stick or there have been so many foreign bodies that I have seen. Um, one of them was really scary. It uh, was a little light up, light up children's ring toy that uh, we that an animal ate, and it was really scary because that had a battery in it, and we can't just make a dog vomit up a battery because it can be corrosive and scary. And so we actually had to go in with um, an, uh, an endoscope, a little tube with a camera on it, and pull it out of the stomach. Um, so fascinating case, but not something I would ever wish on anyone's pet. So um, again, if your pet is known to be naughty, known to get into things, just make sure you keep your, your place really clean um, and, and do your best to um, make sure that your pet uh, doesn't have anything to get into. Also, there are some things, if they like to like chew on like leg front, furniture legs and things like that, there are like bitter sprays you can use um, and stuff like that. So just be mindful and um, make sure your pet doesn't get into any of those things, um, especially things like metals or batteries. Um, those things can, can be really scary. So just be careful. Next one is um, something called a gastric dilation and volvulus, also known uh, more commonly as bloat. Um, Doctors tend to refer to it as a GDV because we don't want to say the whole name every time. Um, but yeah, so it's typically known as bloat, also known as a stomach flip. So it's something that um, is more common in large breed dogs like Great Danes, St. Bernards, Weimaraners, uh, English or Irish setters, Gordon setters. There's a whole list. Um, basically, deep chested dogs um, or large breed dogs in general is more common in. And um, essentially, their stomach. Uh, can rotate on its axis and it can if you if you think of um, if you were to put a rock in a sock or if you were to um, put uh, if you think of like a candy wrapper how it's twisted on both ends of the piece of candy that's essentially um, with the stomach in the middle that's what happens and um, it's really scary because not only does it cut off the flow of um, food coming into the stomach and food leaving the stomach uh, there are also big vessels that um, travel along the stomach on the outside of it. And when the stomach flips, they are kind of connected in a way and those vessels can flip too and also um, blood circulation can get cut off. So it is a really big emergency if you notice that your animal stomach is starting to get distended. Um, if they're trying to vomit but not producing anything, those are two really big signs that you need to take your pet straight to the ER. Um, and, uh, but it is preventable. So if you have like a Great Dane, you say, hey, I know that this can happen to Great Danes. Uh, let's say uh, they're going in for their neuter uh, or their spay. And um, while they're under this anesthetic procedure, you might as well, you know, uh, get the bang for your buck. You might as well do everything under one anesthetic procedure that you can. And one of those things that um, I usually have people at least consider with their veterinarians is something called a gastropexy. And that's a, fun, a fancy doctor word for gastro stomach pexy tacking. So what happens is you tack the stomach to the body wall. And um, it's, it's, it's pretty successful in preventing that stomach rotation. And so it can be something that's done preventatively, or if unfortunately this does happen to your pet, it's almost always done when they go and they unflip the stomach, they'll usually tack it to the body wall so it doesn't happen again. Um, so that's one of those things um, that can be preventable. And when people are considering, hey, should I have this procedure done, you know, on their large breed deep chested dog, you know, it's something that I always say, hey, consult with your veterinarian, ask them, you know, if this is right for your individual animal. But the way that I think of it is, you know, it's investing in your pet's health. And, um, you know, this is something that would cost a couple hundred extra hundred dollars um, to add to a routine procedure, a routine surgery um, that could help prevent an emergency surgery down the line that could cost thousands of dollars where your pet is in a critical condition and surgery is therefore more risky. Um, so I would much rather, you know, spend a little bit of money now, um, a little bit of extra money now to prevent having to spend all that money later and to prevent a possibly life-threatening condition, you know, happening to your pet. So, 
Uh, yeah, next topic is uh, basically more reasons to spay and neuter your pets um, because spaying and neutering your animals can prevent um, a lot of bad stuff. It can prevent what we all think of, which is, you know, um, unintended uh, pregnancies, unintended puppies, um, and it can also prevent things like um, a pyometra, which is essentially when um, a female's uh, uterus gets infected and fills with infected fluid or pus, and um, that pus can, um, if, if there's a, a hole in the uterus and it goes into the abdomen, it can cause sepsis um, or a body-wide bacterial infection that can be life-threatening um, and yeah it can cause um, it can just be really scary and um, be the cause for an emergency surgery spaying your pet can also decrease the risk of mammary cancer which is really great I even looked up a little um, statistic for you guys um, so basically the risk of a dog developing mammary a mammary tumor is 0.5% if spayed before their first heat cycle at around six months of age. It's 8% after their first heat cycle and 26% after their second heat cycle. So um, I think that's a pretty good reason to try to um, have your, your dog spayed either right before or right after their first heat cycle um, to try to prevent something like mammary cancer. Um, also in, uh, in boy dogs, you know, neutering them can obviously help prevent something called testicular cancer because if they do not have testicles they cannot get testicular cancer so another preventable emergency um sometimes preventable is uh pancreatitis and um the reason why i say sometimes preventable it's not always preventable but one of the causes of it one of one of the triggers of it um can be fatty foods and um so pancreatitis uh, the pancreas is responsible for creating enzymes that help digest your food um, and sometimes if it gets really inflamed, it gets confused, and instead of putting these enzymes exactly where they're supposed to go, which is into your uh, GI tract, it gets confused and it will they will leak elsewhere and they are responsible for breaking things down, so it causes a lot of inflammation in the area, a lot of pain, um, and if severe enough, it can be really life-threatening. Um, and one of the ways that you can try to prevent this is to um, not give your pets fatty foods. And uh, one particular culprit of this is fatty people foods, things with a lot of grease or a lot of butter. Definitely avoid in your pets because um, they can pretty easily be affected by it. My last category for dogs, and um, this is also applicable to cats um, just for, for different uh, diseases, but um, please, please, please have your animals vaccinated, um, especially puppies. Get them vaccinated. I believe most places do it every two weeks. Um, talk to your veterinarian about which vaccines um, are, are, you know, uh, best for your individual animal, but I always err on the side of you know, get whichever ones your veterinarian recommends. You know, I'd rather have my patients be more covered than less covered. And two of the big ones that we see in the emergency room are, uh, one of them is parvovirus, which is a, um, a virus that attacks the, um, the lining of the GI tract. It also attacks the bone marrow. And so it can make puppies really, really sick. Um, they get really, really bad bloody diarrhea and they also get really low um, white blood cells and it can be really scary. Um, it can definitely be life-threatening and um, I, I just hate to see sick puppies coming through the ER. So, and it's something that can be prevented um, by vaccination. And I'm so, so lucky that we live in a world where we have a tool like that to combat really, really scary diseases like this. Another one is called leptospirosis, which is a bacteria that um, attacks the liver and the kidneys. It's spread in urine. Um, and yeah, so it's just a big one um, that can also be really life-threatening. So, so these are just two big ones that I talked to your veterinarian about getting your um, animal vaccinated for. And that's all I've got for you guys today. Be sure to like and subscribe um, and also comment down below uh, what you guys want to see me do next. Um, do you guys want more pet videos? Do you want me to talk about your pet's diet or um, give you new puppy tips? Um, let me know in the comments below. Have a great day and I'll see you next time.